Okay, so I've established all the shows that introduced me to horror as a kid, and now is the time to finally break them into uh, tiers of scary, shall we say. Right at the bottom, you've got Scooby-Doo just easing you in with its charm, and then you build up the imagery with Courage the Cowardly Dog, but then you get a slice of reality with Goosebumps, and then right at the top, you get Therapy. Alright, so Are You Afraid of the Dark is the only one of these horror kid shows to actually give me physical nightmares. For me, it served as a casual transition between horror for kids and horror for adults. I know we throw that transition around a lot, but I personally remember this being the one show that carried me out of my childhood altogether and allowed me to develop into the well-rounded, anxious, paranoid-ridden adult that I am today. I wouldn't change a thing about it. Although, while I can sit here and give you some pretentious analysis on the hidden meaning behind Courage or several Goosebump stories, I honestly don't really have much to say subtextually about this show, and it works better for it. It's more a matter of what it represented as opposed to anything it ever did. Co-creator DJ McHeel, which sounds like I should be reviewing a hip-hop album, was pretty adamant that the one and only goal of the show was to tell cool, creepy, and compelling stories. And while shows like Goosebumps usually attempted to soften their horror with lighthearted humour, Are You Afraid of the Dark did not hold back on the cynicism, bar the occasional campy cartoonish moments. In fact, given how much it took inspiration from existing fairy tales and urban legends, which were commonly much more grim than contemporary fiction typically makes them out to be, all bets were off with this show, and a lot of kids met their demise on many occasions, such as in my personal favourite, The Tale of the Dead Man's Float, which sees a young Jay Baruchel go for a casual dip in the pool, only to be dragged down by an unseen presence who drowns the poor kid. But hey, at least he didn't see what his killer actually looked like, Am I right? <laughs> There's definitely a reason I stopped swimming. The show involved a group of teens known as the Midnight Society, who got together at a secret location each week and took it in turns to share scary stories. And once they threw some nose candy on the fire, BAM! You entered the stuff of nightmares. But, while I still think Goosebumps had the superior writing chops given it was adapted from decently written books, Are You Afraid is best remembered as a pure, joyful celebration of the genre. This is a show that should be taken at face value. It actually kickstarted the whole horror kid show boom of the 90s, early 2000s, given it debuted five years prior to Goosebumps in Halloween 1990. It then ended a year after Goosebumps had started, before Nickelodeon revived the series in 1999 for an additional two season run after Goosebumps had concluded. So you've got to admire how much influence and debt clearly derives from Are You Afraid of the Dark, as Goosebumps practically practically served to carry on its torch, given it took on a very similar stylistic format that Are You Afraid effectively established. Whew, that's a lot of words. The major difference between both shows, however, was that Are You Afraid felt like it centred itself around the rapport amongst the Midnight Society and the general camaraderie we gain from creepy storytelling. What made it so unique was that it captured the essence behind why people enjoy scary stories, not just in terms of sensationalism, although it certainly mattered, but rather it was the sentiment of sharing an experience that took you far away from your comfort zone. I understand the adrenaline rush that watching horror alone can give you, but I much prefer watching horror with friends because there's a powerful unity that's long-lasting. And that's essentially why the Midnight Society were so paramount to the show. They made the experience feel personal, relatable, and most of all, believable. Yeah, sure, the stories are all blatantly fictional, but that doesn't weaken them emotionally. I was more compelled to come back each week because I felt like I was invited to be part of their little secret society, even if they were pretty vicious when it came to recruiting new members. Remember that dead man's float story? That kid didn't secure enough votes to get in, which to that I say, you have a cheek to have such high standards when one of your successful initiates tells the teal off the phantom cab. Yeah, it wasn't a strong start for the series, but they followed it up with Laughing in the Dark, so they made a quick comeback. This is a clown story. I hate clowns. They're creepy. They give me nightmares. Where's my thermos? 
Goosebumps simply doesn't have that sense of unity. It worked because it was focused and self-contained per episode as opposed to stringing together a platform for the stories. You could say R.L. Stein filled in that Midnight Society role, but his appearances were extremely rare. Now, of course, the Midnight Society were plagued with the same vapid banter of most children's shows at the time. Their interactions were goofy but charming 90s TV schluck, but I always felt the pulpy feel of the show's presentation was very deliberate. Like, it seemed self-aware enough, largely in part to paying homage to the show's main inspiration, The Twilight Zone. This 1960s anthology series set an almost unbeatable standard for any anthology that followed. And yes, that includes Tales from the Crypt, Inside Number 9, and Black Mirror. Yeah, 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 totally subjective, whatever. Anyway, what was essential to The Twilight Zone, at least for its time, was that it made viewers question their understanding of reality through provocative outcomes. Obviously, it came during the height of the Cold War era and capitalized on public fear and paranoia, but fundamentally, its core legacy rests in surprising audiences with largely simple ideas infused with a bit of shock factor. Take, for example, Time Enough at Last, where Burgess Meredith plays a bookworm who finds himself the sole survivor of a nuclear war and sees his last hope in an endless collection of books to feed his sanity and loneliness. Then he drops his glasses and can't read without them. That's not fair. <laughs> That's not fair. Oh, the humanity. I mean, it manages to be so minuscule and immensely heartbreaking at the same time, yet there was a surreal beauty in how satisfying that tragedy was to the point of being almost hilarious. There's a lot to The Twilight Zone from a thematic point of view, but the real highlight was the use of ironic twist that felt strangely euthoric. And for me as a kid, storytelling like this was all about that euthoria. As you get older, storytelling becomes more about the journey than the destination and whatnot, but Are You Afraid took the main appeal of The Twilight Zone and recognized that sometimes just wanting to be shocked, surprised, and pulled out of your comfort zone was a much more rewarding experience. Frankly, all the substance in the world doesn't accumulate to much when all I effectively want is a cheap thrill. And while that sounds like a negative, I feel that's where Are You Afraid of the Dark made its lasting impression on me. While Goosebumps spread little nuggets of scares throughout its story, Are You Afraid rarely revealed any of its scares until the latter half of the episode, after it reached a tipping point. And it played greatly on your curiosity, especially with episodes like The Pinball Wizard that had a negative ending for the protagonist. Just look at the ghastly Grinner, for example. Betty Ann tells the story of an aspiring teenage comic book writer who is given the one existing issue of a mysterious comic book whose author disappeared called the Ghastly Grinner, which includes victims that end up stuck in unstoppable hysterical laughter, and basically the whole town starts to fall victim to the same fate. You know where this is all going, but for the main character, their world starts to collapse and blur itself with fantasy until they're completely isolated, at which point, well... Okay, so it's no Joker or Pennywise, but this show understood how sensationalized it needed to be to work as a primetime live-action horror show for kids. At times it was jarring, and at other times it was just plain grotesque. I talk a lot about subtlety in storytelling, and bar a few occasional episodes like The Frozen Ghost, this show went for style over everything else, but rewarded the viewer with convincing visual scares through makeup and prosthetics that could rival the effects of adult shows like The X-Files. When I said the show was self-aware, this was very clear in their revival, when they decided to add their own nostalgic spin to it by having the new society be led by Tucker, the younger brother of the first generation's leader Gary, who returns to the very same spot abandoned several years ago. Granted, it wasn't the strongest final two seasons, the dynamic in the group wasn't as organic as before, and many episodes seemed to rehash previous episodes or just straight up lift their premise from other films like Jumanji and Re animator, but it still had some memorable moments that at least felt more like a homage than a direct ripoff, like the teal of many faces was inspired by the Twilight Zone, the hunt that used a cinematic style similar to Evil Dead, and Highway 13 had a compelling chase sequence inspired by Jewel and Mad Max. 
interestingly enough, in the second season of the revival, Gary does actually make a return for his own nostalgic purposes, as part of a three episode miniseries where he must track down the original Midnight Society from 1937 to prevent an evil black magic from the Silver Sight, where it brings fantasy into reality for the very first time, but it was nowhere near the big payoff you'd be hoping for. Hey, how about letting an old timer sit in tonight? It's cool. I'm Tucker's brother. I used to run these meetings. Uh... Similar to The Twilight Zone, Are You Afraid of the Dark established its own standard for children's horror. There was an intimacy to be found in how it was structured as a show. It was like getting together with your closest friends for a monster of the week and being left excited for what lurked around the corner next time. Watching it, you actually felt mature and treated like an adult. The Midnight Society perpetuate the harmony and togetherness most of, if not all of us, love about the medium of fiction. And as a result, the show became this honest time capsule of horror and the wild imaginations we develop growing up. It's wild, it's crazy, it's occasionally stupid, but at the end of the day, it reminded us that being scared can definitely have its upsides. Hey folks, thanks for watching another childhood nostalgia video. Uh, I want to go towards more adult-centric horror now, but I will come back to this now and again, so keep sending those suggestions my way, and please leave your own thoughts in the comments below on the show and on other things in general. If you want to support the show and help it grow, you can do so by supporting me on Patreon, where you can get early access and also vote on future videos. And until next time, you can follow me on Twitter. Stay safe, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye.